Welcome, I'm Warno Deschalet, and this is A Baha'i Perspective. Welcome to A Baha'i Perspective. I recorded an interview with Kim Douglas on October 12, 2020. Kim is a writer, educator, and small business owner. She speaks widely on topics related to personal transformation, family, race relations, health and nutrition, and the individual's role in improving society. As a business owner, she provides education on the health benefits of whole food nutrition. She co-authored Kevin Locke's autobiography, Arising, and wrote her own autobiography, High Desert, a journey of survival and hope, which we feature in the interview. I started the interview by asking Kim where she grew up and what was religious life like growing up. Well, the first part of my life was in San Bernardino, California, the first five years. And then my parents returned to Chicago, where they were from. And I lived in Evanston and spent first grade through junior high there, well, through high school, actually, and then my parents moved to Glenview, Illinois, and I graduated from high school there, and religious upbringing, my mom was raised Catholic and was pretty committed to Catholicism. My dad was exploring all religions. He really was a more anti-religious communities. He felt like they did more damage than good but had a philosophical hunger and did a lot of study of religion and thought they were more similar than different. He did not attend church, did not go to church, and used to put my mom down, actually, Mm. for her Catholic belief. It was typical of my dad, I think, because of his brain health issues. He had a hunger and a search. I could see him reading and into philosophy and into exploring. But then another part of him just would put everything down. So So which side of that were you leaning toward as you were growing up and being a teenager? Well, when I was young, I did go to the Catholic Church. And I remember talking to some young friends, and we would talk about God. We would talk about Jesus, and there was something in me that responded to prayer, to church. And then when I became a teenager, to be honest, I was more interested in friends (laughs) and having fun, and church wasn't on that list of things to do at the time, so I stepped away from church going and didn't have any problem doing so. I probably began to question my belief in God because there was so much turmoil going on at home that I just wondered how a God could allow all the problems in the world and in homes that there were. What was your spiritual path then from that perspective to finding the Baha'i faith? I think poetry and writing was really where I felt closely connected to my soul. It was the one place where I was authentic, where I put my questions, where I explored. I remember in college when I took creative writing classes, I felt like it was a prayer or meditation. I just felt connected to my soul. And I remember at one time believing that I would just make up my own way of living. It would be good. But I didn't really think churches or any particular religious group had the answers. I saw more, you know, how could we create war in the name of God? So I was very skeptical of organized religion and really just planned to live a good life. I would borrow the best from, 
maybe different scriptures and poets and philosophers, but I wasn't ever going to join a church. So it was really surprising to me when I came upon the Baha'i Faith and all that changed. What did that transformation look like? I mean, what did you go through to go from that to actually joining a quote-unquote organized religion? Well, it's fascinating. I met a couple. I was traveling across the country with a friend, and I was in Arizona, and we were visiting a friend of my friend's whose parents were visiting from Wilmette, Illinois, and they were Baha'is, and they didn't mention the Baha'i faith initially, that they were lovely, lovely people, and they really encouraged me in my move. I had left a really abusive situation. I was traveling on my own. A lot of people would not encourage me. But when they heard some of what was occurring, they were just very supportive. They thought that the poet who had recommended I move to Arizona, that I do so. They shared authentically about their life and their transformation. And I fell in love with them. I just thought they were two wonderful people on this earth. And when I asked them, why is it you're so different than most older people I know? And they said, well, maybe it's because we're Baha'is. And I said, what's that? And they said, well, it's a religion. And I said, I am not at all interested. I'm not into religion at all. And they were quiet. They just let it be. But Fran put in my suitcase a couple of pamphlets and a book that I actually did not find until months later. It seemed like it was the right time. When I looked back for me to find it, I had settled in Tucson. And I looked through the material. I kind of chuckled to myself. And I thought, wow, this is everything I believe. The equality of men and women, the elimination of prejudices of all kinds, that science and religion are both right. They're both part of the same truth. And many other teachings that caught my attention. And I just thought I need to check this out. So that was the beginning. I made a call, got to meet some of the Baha'is in Tucson, was still not planning to join anything organized. But that just lasted a while after I met the community and had some very powerful experiences that had me decide I'm going to join the Baha'i faith. And if anything's ever fishy or weird, I give myself permission to leave. And, you know, here I am, 63. I was in my tw- <laughs> 20s when that happened. So I've, I've been here a long time. Now, you're a business owner in which you provide education on health benefits of whole food nutrition. Now, how did you get into the business of counseling people on whole food nutrition? I had a few things happen, and you know, often our our tragedies can become our testimony, and I lost a number of young friends to cancer and family members, and they left children behind, and I was devastated, and I didn't want to be next. I was raising my kids at the time, and I started to really search for answers. I thought these people were not real sick where you expected a cancer diagnosis and a death. And I met a doctor who was giving a talk on whole food nutrition. I went to that talk, began to do some work with her, and really learned about the power of food to heal and the importance of healthy lifestyle choices. That was the beginning of a lot of change in our family. We really took our health seriously, ate a lot of fruits and vegetables. We're all supposed to eat 7 to 13 servings a day and 90% of us don't. So I provide education to help people change their shopping carts and some options to get more fruits and vegetables into their diet easily. And that became a little side business for me. I became a certified health coach and really find great value in helping people transform their health habits. Now, I'm aware of two books that you've written. The first is called Arising with Kevin Locke, and I think there was another author along with you on his 
autobiographical story. And the second is High Desert, which we're featuring in this interview. Was a rising your first endeavor in writing a book? No, it wasn't. That came later. I wrote High Desert first. Oh, and, okay. Yeah, and I had written many poems that had been published in you know small journals, and I always had this hunch that I was going to write a memoir about my experiences of healing from childhood violence and breaking the cycle of violence. So that was first. You know, I was in prayer wondering about the writing project and had the idea of connecting with Kevin Locke and inspired him to share his story. So you were familiar with Kevin Locke's story and you wanted to get it out there? You know, an interesting experience. And in the the end of Arising, I have a little blurb about how this came to be. I meditate every day and I pray every day. And I loved and admired Patricia Locke. I didn't know her, but I loved what she did in the world. And I felt like she was... <laughs> pressing upon my soul to connect with Kevin and help him write a book. And I thought at first, you know, when this was happening, I thought, I'm crazy. You know, I don't know Kevin that well. I can't do this. He's going to wonder who's calling me with this idea. But I kept feeling this impulse and prayer to proceed with this. So I did reach out to Kevin and this story is so fascinating because he was like, well, why would anybody want to read a book about me? And of course, you know, for those of us who know him, he's, you know, world-renowned hoop dancer, an award-winning flautist, and he is just a very humble soul. And um, I tried to convince him that his book would be very worthwhile and of interest to people. And he was like, well, I don't want to do anything that's self-serving. So I spent a while, we had some conversations and I asked him, I said, if I can show you how this would serve other people, would you be open to writing your story? And he said, well, I'm not a writer. And I said, well, I am, I could help you with that. So that's kind of how we began that journey. And it was a wonderful journey, collaboration. It did take longer than we thought. But Kevin's travel schedule back then and my work schedule, we did what we could and finally the book came together. And for those who may not be aware of who Kevin Locke is, what would you tell people in regards to maybe having them read the book? Well, Kevin Locke is a member of the Lakota tribe. He is a world-renowned hoop dancer, and a hoop dance is a very sacred dance to indigenous communities. He's traveled to over 96 countries to perform. He's an educator, has a master's degree, and has worked with children, inspiring them to really embrace their gifts and talents, to live lives of service and to unite. He's a member of the Baha'i community and has served in profound ways to promote the oneness of humanity and to help us all eliminate our prejudices. He's won numerous awards. He's performed at places like the Kennedy Center. And he's very humble. I think his deepest desire would be to perform for a group of children in some small island you know, the Kennedy Center is very prestigious, but that's not what he needs to feel as if he is serving God and fulfilling his calling. It's a great honor, but he's just as delighted, if not more so, to work with the children around the world and help them become who they're meant to be. So I'd like to feature your new book, High Desert, A Journey of Survival and Hope, in this interview. And this book is an autobiographical account of your abusive upbringing, yet you are able to heal and grow relying on your faith and spiritual beliefs. First of all, why did you entitle the book High Desert? Well, I worked with Terry Cassidy, who was the editor at the time. I did a lot of my healing in the desert. 
in Arizona. That's where I really survived and where I became a Baha'i, the Baha'i faith really was a powerful catalyst for my healing. And I love Arizona. So I used to have a dream that I was traveling in the high desert of Arizona up near the Navajo Nation. It was so powerful, so spiritual, felt like I was traveling right into the center of my soul. So that's how the title came about. So to what extent did your upbringing challenge you to rely on your faith and spiritual beliefs? I don't think I could have survived my upbringing without a path of how to live a more constructive life. You know, I really believe there's, you know, there's destructive forces in the world and there's constructive forces. And I had grown up in a home where there was a lot of devastation and destruction. Abuse and violence hits you body, mind, and spirit. And I was barely functional when I came across the Baha'i faith. I drank to numb all the pain. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I had not had encouragement and guidance to develop my gifts and talents. I was lost, and I really needed a path of teachings that enabled me to see my own nobility and worth. And the Baha'i faith, as many of the world religions, have beautiful teachings, a wonderful community that really fostered the healing and the journey back to my wholeness. The reliance on faith and spiritual beliefs was really the process of healing not so much during your years of abuse growing up, but rather healing from its effects in your young adulthood. Is that what? Yeah, uh-huh. absolutely. Now, the book counsels on how to parent without the life cycle of abuse. So what are some of the ways in which you were able to stop that generational continuance of abuse? Well, I, I, a few different ways. The book definitely goes into that in depth. But I do think, you know, I even raised my kids. I said, smart people get help when they need it. And therapy really helped me to be able to give language to what I had experienced, which was minimized and denied by my family of origin. So I grew up where I didn't tell anybody what was going on. I had to name it and own it. In fact, there's very interesting research out that when people minimize or deny abuse that occurred in childhood, they're much more likely to repeat it. So I'm very, very grateful that I had professional support, again, to give language to what I experienced to share the story, the secrets that were locked inside me, to begin to trust in a therapeutic setting, you develop a relationship with a therapist. And I didn't trust relationships. And so to be able to do that work was very important and to heal and to learn to feel the feelings and to develop emotional intelligence, give language to what I was feeling rather than numbing it with alcohol or overeating. So that was very important for me before stepping into marriage and before having children. I had done a lot of work. I was 30 when I got married, so I'm grateful that it wasn't earlier. I don't think I would have been ready. I also took a lot of parenting courses. I took parenting seriously. And my intention before becoming a parent was to make sure that my children did not go through what I went through. 
Now, my husband, I married a man who was a counselor. He worked with elementary school children. He grew up in a home where his parents fired a babysitter for swatting him on the butt. He had incredible gifts and talents and capacities in the area of raising children. So I had a really strong partner that I went into the parenting process with because parenting for all of us who are parents, we know that it is the most important and among the most challenging of tasks that we ever engage in of work, of life work. We're raising souls. So a lot of parenting classes, did workshops, and my husband and I consulted a lot. I leaned on him a lot when I felt insecure about how to deal with a situation. So that was very helpful. And then having friends that were going through the parenting journey that were authentic and real about the challenges. There's what I call church going, or in the Baha'i community, we have what's called feast. You're on your best behavior at church and at feast. And of course, that's because we're supposed to be. That's where we are. But I needed friends who were going to be real about the challenges of parenting and how we could get through it in the strongest way possible, nurturing the child, um, helping to develop the capacities of our children, and channeling their particular energies in really healthy directions. So parenting, I'd say take parenting classes, do therapy, (laughs) and get support with your friends and community. Find those authentic, real friends that you can support each other along the way because it is a rewarding and challenging task. So Kim, would you like to read an excerpt from High Desert? Sure, I would love to do that. This is called Separation. And you know, at the time when my mom married, separation and divorce was frowned upon. She had gone to her priests at the church and said, you know, she was being beaten, the children were being beaten, and um, told to do whatever she could to placate my dad. This is that rare occurrence of a separation. In fourth grade, I heard about divorce on TV. Couples ended their marriage and began a new life separated from one another. I thought this was the answer for our family. We could get a divorce, couldn't we? We could exist without all the screaming, belt lashes, and flying dishes. We could live without the embarrassment of neighbors overhearing our family feuds. I told my mom about this and begged her to divorce my dad. One morning about a year later, after dad left for work, Mom explained to Mike and me that we were not going to school, that we were going to Grandma's instead. A tear curved down her cheek and she wiped it away with the back of her hand. I'm leaving your dad. We'll stay with Grandma and Nani until I work something out. Though I had begged Mom to leave Dad, I now trembled and felt nauseous at the idea. Mom was dialing a number on the phone, stating our address, and asking for a taxi. She climbed the attic steps and lugged down suitcases she had packed without anyone knowing. We buttoned our coats and left the house on Colfax Street, Mom perching a note against the salt and pepper shakers on the kitchen table on the way out. The ride down familiar street seemed unreal. We passed two-story stucco and brick homes, the leafless elms and maples, bare, almost skeletons in winter, blurred into one another. The gray sky hung heavy over the suburb we left and remained gloomy as we entered the north side of Chicago. Apartments replaced homes, and soon we were walking up the cement steps of Grandma's building. She had returned with her mother, our nanny, to Chicago after Grandpa died. The two-bedroom apartment was fine for them. Grandma worked at Old Orchard Shopping Center for Crocs and Brentano's, a bookstore. Since money was tight, she did not remain home that day to greet us. Instead, Nani stood at the door trembling. 
Though she tried to hide her worry by greeting Mike and me with a hug, we could see it in her eyes. We settled in, and until early evening, the day was rather uneventful. But by five, Mom had posted herself at the window. Her eyes narrowed, and her mouth was one sealed line. She leaned against the wall, smoking. She kept one hand on the edge of the drape, lifting it away from the window now and then to peer out onto Trip Avenue. Every few minutes, Nani checked in on us from the kitchen archway leading into the dining and living rooms. She wiped her hands on the full-bibbed apron and peered at us from behind her wire rim bifocals. She took a deep breath and then turned around and disappeared into the kitchen to finish dipping chicken pieces into egg whites and cornflake crumbs. Mike and I sat on the sofa. Mike was penciling in all the O's in one of Grandma's good housekeeping magazines. Grandma had promised him a dime for every page he completed. He was on his seventh page. Hundreds of O's darkened. Earlier, I had completed a few pages, but after a while felt bored. So instead, I sat with a book in my lap. I turned the pages to Lada on Troublemaker Street. I scanned the lines, moved my eyes across the words, but read nothing. I glanced at the TV screen. Ricky Ricardo stood three inches in front of Lucy, his eyes bulging. He hollered at her in Spanish. She stood frozen, her eyes widening, her lips trembling, and then she bawled her famous cry. Ricky stopped yelling like he always did. He apologized, then hugged and kissed the audience. And the audience laughed. It's him, Mom shouted out. It's him. Nani, hurry, get the kids. Mike, Kim, go. Go with Nani. And this is where I'll just summarize. My mom was certain that my dad would come and kill us. He had a gun and she had taken it. We went into the bathroom, into the tub. We're standing in the tub and waiting for my mom to, you know, she would pull the gun out of her suitcase. She was so terrified, but it was never my dad. He didn't come, he didn't drive over. So nothing like that happened, but the fear that he was going to come after us and kill us was something that my mom lived with, um, not just then, that day, but throughout many years of their marriage. And she did return to him. She did have the job skills, the money, felt pressured. He said, I'll, I promise I'll change. So she returned, but it wasn't long before the abuse restarted. Well, so do you all return when your mom returned? We did. We were young then. We returned back with my dad and continued on living mm. through a lot of years of violence. Mm -hmm. And I managed to start college. I went off at 18 to the University of Missouri and started school there. Got my first bit of freedom and really didn't handle it responsibly or well and ended up dropping out for a while. Returned home met someone who was traveling out west, and she encouraged me to travel with her. And then that's when I left for Arizona. And I really believe there is a God and that I was guided away from that situation and met people in the years to come after leaving home that were instrumental in guiding me to therapists, to the Baha'i faith, and to the instruments for healing that I needed. And I ended up going back to school, went on to graduate school, you know, became a college professor. I mean, I, life turned out really well. I married someone well, but it was a lot of work, and it takes dedication. Abuse is not something that's an overnight healing process. It's lifelong, and I continue to do some of the healing work today. Very grateful that I had enough tools to break the cycle of violence. My daughters are now young adults raising their kids. They think they had the best upbringing in the world, and we're like, well, there's no perfect upbringing. But I'm delighted, of course, to have a close relationship with them and to see 
that the cycle can be broken. And that's a message I would give to everyone that, you know, we live in a world where there is trauma at every turn. And we're all surviving from something. And what we can do is to heal. It's the best gift we can give one another. It's a great contribution to the next generations to come. And for those of us who've experienced family violence, we don't want that going down. We don't want it being repeated. And marriage and raising children has its challenges. And if we haven't done the work, we'll be tested. And there is help to be had and support to be had so that we can create healthy homes for our children. We can have healthy marriages. And I would just say, look for the tools, read the books, see the therapists, do what you need to do, and then live into the pride and the joy that comes with that effort and with facing the challenges that are inevitable and rising to the occasion. Now, did your father also grow up in a, an abusive household? You know, and this is what's so interesting. I am sure that there have to be skeletons in his past, but he was one of those people that denied and minimized. He would always say, we have the best parents, perfect upbringing. I never heard about the violence. I know there was some alcoholism in some parts of the family. There were some brain health issues. And the tragedy is that my dad was in a nursing home at the end of his life. His private behavior became public. He was actually kicked out of the nursing home for trying to hit some of the nurses and put into a behavioral health unit of a hospital. And he was diagnosed with many, many different brain health issues and given medication that he needed probably years earlier. So that's the tragedy for him is that he lived at a time where people didn't talk about brain health. And it was hush hush, you know, go see the doctor <laughs> for the flu. Today, we are more open about brain health issues, and we have a long way to go. We still need to be talking more about it. His sister had brain health issues, that this certainly was something that impacted his family. Not everyone with brain health issues is as violent as my dad was, so I don't know what that was all about. But I'm glad that he was diagnosed and glad he was medicated and could have some years of some calm. I'm speaking with Kim Douglas, a writer, educator, and small business owner. She speaks widely on topics related to personal transformation, family, race relations, health and nutrition, and the individual's role in improving society. As a business owner, she provides educational and health benefits of whole food nutrition. Kim had just read an excerpt from her autobiography, High Desert, and then we, we spoke a little bit about it afterwards. So, Kim, where can people find the book, High Desert? Well, both through Baha'i Publishing and Amazon. And it's available, I believe, on Kindle and in paperback. Now, I notice you have a website, kimdouglas.org. What would people find on your website? They will find a few different things. First of all, they will also find a link there to ordering my book and also Arising. I have a lot of information about writing. I am teaching writing courses online. I've had many people approach me saying, would you help me write a book? And I simply can't help all the people that are asking. So I am teaching writing courses, and I'll be starting up a writing nine-month series in January to help people with a book idea take it from that seed of an idea to a full draft. 
So some of that is on my website. I'm also involved with a few other women in creating a group called Advancement for All Women. And this is a place where we have what I call a Zoom cast instead of a podcast. (laughs) We have a Zoom cast and we're diverse women who have different gifts and talents. And we're creating a culture where we invite women to come and share their stories, their gifts and talents, and really magnifying their greatness, trying to create a culture of rather than competitiveness and jealousy, which can so occur in our professional world, of featuring women we love and admire. All women have gifts and talents. And when we learn to see the good in each other, it just creates a whole different kind of world. So we talk about things, everything from overcoming racism to sexism and then featuring people in various fields that offer gifts and talents. And then my health and wellness business is on there as well. I noticed there was a separate website, advancementofallwomen.com. I guess that's where people can find information on what you just described for that group? Yes, there's a direct link to that. From your website, kimdouglas.org, you mean? Yes, Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, And so you had described some of the things that probably one would find on advancementofallwomen.com. Is there other things that they'd find as well or... Well, they'll see some featured videos. We are we do one to two Zoom casts a month. Those are being uploaded onto the website, and different women from doctors to writers are featured. So they they would see that. They'll see the founders. One of my friends, Kiera Hensley was one of our founding members and she unfortunately passed away last December to cancer. She so wanted to see this group form and be a part of it. So we're continuing on in her honor, in her legacy, building upon it. And she was all about the worthiness of women, that so many of us have been stripped of our worthiness and regaining our nobility and dignity is one of the most worthwhile efforts we can engage in, and we can do it better in community. Kim, do you have a next book project in mind or in progress? I have two right now, and one is I am in an interracial marriage, and I've learned a lot about race relations, racism, dismantling racism. And I have another memoir in me that's started coming out and in kind of vignette form, just different awakenings, awarenesses, some of the more painful memories of what we've gone through as a couple, what family members who are dark skinned have gone through. And of course, we are living at a time right now where that conversation is alive and well. So that's definitely happening. I'm working on that. And I'm also very interested in exploring the questions around success and how people might redefine success. The American cultural definitions and norms around success don't necessarily serve people. And I notice in my own business, I work with a lot of partners, that one of the biggest struggles, especially of women, is never feeling like we're enough. And coming from a place of not enoughness or our scarcity, our inadequacies, is really something we need to unpack, dismantle, and begin to examine our individual and collective strengths and to redefine success on our own terms, to see what we're doing in the home, in our families, as mothers, as family members, as professionals, to begin to look at all the worthwhile endeavors and not hold on to the old 
definitions of what success is from really a more masculine model. So I'm very interested in exploring that. I find myself writing now more about the race issue, but I know that other book is also pulling at me, and I find I'm sometimes scribbling notes about that as well. Now, would you be able to share just a summary of an occasion where you became made aware of an unconscious understanding from a white person being married to your husband? Oh, yes. In fact, I have a blog post about this. I had a situation during the time of the Rodney King riots. We were watching the news one night, and I said to David, I said, "Hun, why are they destroying their neighborhood? Why are they all destroying their neighborhood? <laughs> oh, I laugh now because it's so ridiculously pathetic. My husband said, Kim, would you just repeat what you said? <laughs> and I knew by the way he was asking, I was like, oh, it's, I knew the word they and all of them. Why are they all destroying their neighborhood? It didn't take me but a second. I knew enough about race and my own tendency. I think we all have an unconscious bias that we're trying to discard. I knew what I had said was loaded with racial overtones and racism. And of course, we talked about that. My husband's very patient and kind and it you know, therapy background, we used all his skills. And it was very obvious to me that first of all, the media magnifies over and over and over and over. As we know from recent riots, we had more peaceful protests than riots. But what we see on the news is often a magnification of the worst events. So in Los Angeles, I was given the image of, you know, a dozen or so people setting fire to something. The language I use, why are they all doing that, when most of the people were not violent, most African Americans were not showing up in that way, there were some, just really is bias. You know, as a a college professor, you know, I taught diversity classes and I always told my students, I said, I am weeding my heart of the tendencies I inherited from growing up in this country, which is a nation built on white supremacy and on racism, on slavery. And I'm doing the best I can, but, you know, people think because I'm married to someone who's dark that I don't have a racist bone in my body. And that would be minimizing and denying a reality in our country. And so for me to be open to look at what I need to look at and weed my heart of those tendencies that are written about in the Baha'i writings, you know, that we need to weed our own heart from these tendencies. It's lifelong work. It's going to take generations to do. I'm committed to that. I'm committed to learning where racism shows up in me and weeding my heart. So, you know, when students heard that, that was really powerful and it invites them rather than hiding in shame, I can't possibly have this, or denying and minimizing something that we all know is so bad and so wrong that we have to, I think, normalize that we come from this history and that we have work to do. We're not good or bad people. We are people that have inherited this disease, this cancer, and we're healing. I'm thinking that it's really an opportunity for white folks to open their eyes to the privilege that they naturally gained by this societal setup that's only available to them because of the color of their skin. And an individual white person never has to represent all of white people in their actions and their behavior, whereas every person of color, that's always the liability that whatever they may do gets 
translated into all of people of their color, yeah, which absolutely. is it's a burden. Well, Cam, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. This was really very enlightening. Thank you. Well, you're so welcome. Thank you so much for asking me to share. I really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, and I appreciate how you're willing to be open to the pain that you've been through through your life. That's quite remarkable, I think. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be on this side of it. I'll tell you yeah. that. And there is a lot of joy and happiness. You know, if we feel our pain we and go through it, we can feel our joy, our happiness, and really appreciate the healing that is there to be had. So thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Kim Douglas, author of High Desert, A Journey of Survival and Hope. You can find this interview and other interviews on the website abahaiperspective.com and on the YouTube channel A Baha'i Perspective. For information specifically on the Baha'i faith, you can go to the website baha'i.org or you can call the number 1-800-22-UNITE. I hope you join me next time on A Baha'i Perspective.
Not but the rose of love 